Hi everyone, and thank you for coming along. So um, my name is Jen Barwick, and I am a project and policy officer in PERSA, and I'm uh, one of the team that are working towards developing the new Biosecurity Act here in PERSA. Uh, many of you attending today will have already would already know Andrew, who is online, and Andrew is the program manager. <laughs> here and leading the development of the Biosecurity Act and joining us also um, online as panelists today who um, uh, as it's Nathan Rhodes, Executive Director, give everyone a wave Nathan, <laughs> and John Virtue uh, and he's a Biosecurity SA. So um, yes, yeah, so my role today is very brief. Um, I'm going to do some quick housekeeping, uh, introduce you to today's agenda and then I'm going to be turning my camera off and uh, providing some of the tech support uh, for Andrew as he presents. So if uh, by any chance this goes pear-shaped, blame Nathan. Um, today's agenda will involve, um, Andrew's going to go through, he's going to introduce you to the approach we're developing. We're going to, uh, it's going to be pretty content heavy, but we are going to encourage you to be involved and be part of the conversation. There's some multiple ways that you can do that. Can I get you to flick to the next slide, Andrew? Um, so we're gonna, um, we're gonna break up the content section um, and the next one with a few tools in this webinar. So um, we're going to be asking some poll questions and uh, we're gonna get you to give your feedback in the Q and A. Um, and then we're also uh, going to have a bit of a Q and A at the end. So, but I guess the first thing I want to say that webinars are a bit different to the team meetings and the Zoom meetings we may have all had, where we all have access to our camera and our microphone. And this one's a bit different. We um, we haven't opened the microphone or the camera to everyone, but you're still going to be able to have uh, a participate in this webinar. So. One of the ways that you are able to do it is in the Q&A. So um, if you look down on the bottom of your screen, you should have a little Q&A icon down there. If you click it, a little panel will pop up and you can add your comment uh, or an, add a question in that panel. Um, and uh, if you are seeing those questions come through and you think they're pretty good, you can actually upvote the questions by hitting the little thumbs up button. And it just means that it will raise that question to the top. And when we get to the point where we want to talk to some of those questions or comments that are in, the box, um, Andrew will start from the top and it will be the one that's that's the highest rank. So, and work his way down. The other option there is you raise your hand. So this is for the braver people in the room. So uh, if you would like to talk to your question, if you want to talk to and provide some context to um, one of the poll responses that you do, um, you know, raise your hand. Um, it's a little icon down, it should be at the bottom of the participants list where it says raise a hand and um, you will be able to turn your microphone, I will be able to turn your microphone on for you and, um, and, and give you the floor. Um, so don't forget to unselect it though, once you've had your chance to have your say. So the other, um, in the next slide, and finally, the, the way that we're also going to try and grab uh, some of your feedback and input today will be through the poll questions. We've based these poll questions on the Your Say. Uh, if you've had a chance to check out Your Say, you'll see that there's a survey there. Um, and this one's a little different, like, unlike the Your Say where you get free text and you can provide some context around you know, why you strongly agree or strongly disagree to a, to the question. This one's just going to be the straight agree, disagree. But again, that's where we're going to encourage you to use your Q&A box um, and to add some context and some, some uh, feedback on those questions. So, or raise your hands. So again, um, uh, welcome to today. And uh, I will hand over to Andrew to do the, the next part. Thank you, Jen, for that introduction and giving a bit of a, an overview of um, how the webinars operate. Um, you may have worked out that Jen's uh, in the room with me here. I might just get her to mute her mic so I don't get the echo in my ear. Uh, so she's sitting next to me. Um, so thank you for all um, logging in today. Uh, it's good to see so many people here and, and quite a number of familiar faces as well. So um, my name's, as I've said, Andrew Copers, and I'm the privilege of uh, having the role of project manager for the delivery of the Biosecurity Act. Uh, and working a lot of, with a lot of you over the last 18 months to get to this point um, through the targeted consultation um, and the development of the technical directions paper, um, which is a lot of the um, basis of the content that we'll be working through today. Um, so as Jen said, we're really keen to get your feedback and your views, so please make uh, use of the Q&A box, ask your questions, 
uh, raise your hand, um, interject um, and ask your questions, make comments. Uh, and John and Nathan and Jen are here as well to, to help support um, providing any uh, answers and, and context around any of the questions or clarity that you might be seeking. Um, so what we really want to do is, is seek your views and um, get some feedback um, around um, um, you know, what we're proposing um, and um, use the content or the feedback from this webinar to really feed into um, the broader feedback that we'll be receiving through the Your Say process. Uh, to um, help inform the drafting of the biosecurity bill, which is then will present another opportunity for um, a review of um, where things are heading um, and um, provide some feedback to help us refine the bill before we then go through the parliamentary stages. But I'll, I'll touch on next steps a bit later uh, in my presentation. Um, now to start off, um, Jen was going to do a poll around um, just to get a, a you know, a, it's an opportunity to practice the poll uh, and see how it works, but also just to get a sense of, of where everyone's um, coming from. Um, so I'll just launch the poll now. So that will pop up on your screen. Um, so the question will be, what industry sector do you represent? And there's a number of categories there. Um, so hopefully you'll be able to find a category that fits, fits you. Um, if not, there's another box as well. So I'll launch that now and I'll just give us a, a few, you know, 20 seconds or so to, to respond. And that will give us a, you know, a bit of a hands-on um, go of how the, the polling will work. And there'll be a number of poll questions throughout um, the, my session just to sort of break it up, but also to get some feedback from you as well. So I'll launch that now. Uh, here we go. So you should see that up on your screen now. So I'll just give you a few few seconds to respond to that. Okay, so, oops, we've still got a couple more coming in. All right, I'll just end that now. <clears throat> Excuse me. So you should see, oh, no, I've got to share the results. Sorry, I'm getting used to this myself as well. So just, you should see up on your screen the results of the poll. So um, seeing that uh, a third of us from government um, and then um, almost a third from industry body or association um, and then primary producers and others represented there as well. So the, the questions that we have will um, you know, have a similar experience and come up with the results and it just gives an opportunity to get a, a feel um, for how um, you're all feeling uh, and your views um, and also just to see how the other participants are, are responding to um, some of the questions that we're asking as well and some of the content we're um, covering. So I'll just take that away now. So um, just, sorry, clear my screen. So I just want to first touch off um, with the purpose and objective of the new Biosecurity Act. What, what are we trying to achieve? So I think we can all be in agreement that primary industries are a real critical part of um, South Australia's um, economy and the contribution that they make. Uh, and so they're very much worth protecting um, and um, making sure that we have good practices in place to secure our biosecurity. Um, now biosecurity risks are continually um, increasing, both in complexity and their scale, um, and, and they're always growing through um, increased trade and travel um, that we um, are seeing globally, but also in Australia as well. So the new Biosecurity Act is an important step uh, to improve our biosecurity system, while continuing to provide strong powers for the prevention, detection, management, and eradication of pests and diseases. So what is the purpose of developing the new Act? So the fundamental purpose is to protect South Australia from pests and diseases that are economically significant, uh, threaten our terrestrial and aquatic environments, or that may affect public amenities, community activities, and infrastructure. So what we're proposing is uh, building a contemporary legal framework, which will have all the components required to, um, in a comprehensive biosecurity act, um, to achieve this fundamental purpose. As we develop the new act, we uh, will aim to keep the best parts um, of our current approach, the current legislation and the current system that we have, but also while building in those opportunities for improvement as well. Um, and a lot of the, the consultation that we have done and will continue to do is really sort of um, trying to identify those opportunities to make sure that we're building them in, and, you know, in the opportunity of, of developing a new act, which doesn't come around um, very often. 
So this approach is, is really about improving the consistency in our biosecurity uh, and making sure that the current in innovative approaches that we have in one sector specific piece of legislation can be applied across all sectors. So again, that consistency. So we have you know, good things in animal health, good things in plant health, they should be expanded um, across those other sectors uh, to enable those opportunities to be available as well. Um, so that not only creates consistency in our approach, which of course brings about efficiency and clarity, but it also prevent, presents those opportunities for those sectors uh, and a more efficient regulatory environment. Um, we're looking at some core concepts as part of um, building in the new um, act or the new legal framework, and they're, they're really modern principles, so, you know, but we're referring to them as core concepts. Um, and they are you know, shared responsibility, uh, risk-based decision-making, and the third one being proactive management of biosecurity risk, which I'll, I'll touch on in a little bit more detail soon. Um, so we all know that good biosecurity requires every South Australian to work together and for everyone to take responsibility for their actions. Uh, and that's why shared responsibility is so important and, and is a core concept. Uh, the other core concept around risk-based decision-making, you know, it's, it's about matching the levels of regulation that we're building into the new framework to match the level of risk that we're trying to manage. So having a, a appropriate regulation um, matched to the risk. So we want that to be efficient and fit for purpose regulation as much as possible. The third core concept around proactive biosecurity management is about the ability to proactively manage biosecurity risks um, and to take action based on a reasonable suspicion that a, a risk is, um, is there, is present, but without having the actual um, evidence necessarily um, to prove that the risk is there. So it needs to be a reasonable suspicion, you know, a, a high level of um, 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 assurance, well, a high level of suspicion or, or confidence of the risk is there, um, but the ability to take proactive quick action, which is really important in biosecurity responses um, while we uh, continue to assess the situation. So that helps with prevention and, and also early detection of biosecurity risks. Um, nationally, uh, and um, you know, the, the national biosecurity system working with other jurisdictions um, is really important. So we want this framework to continue to support um, uh, the national arrangements and be consistent and as harmonised as possible uh, and continue to support those important market access requirements and trade arrangements um, so we can continue to um, uh, benefit and trade on South Australia's you know, good quality food, fibre and beverages um, and also to give effect to those intergovernmental agreements that South Australia has signed up to as well to make sure that what we're committing to at those national forums our legislation is able um, to enact uh, and put into place um, for the benefit of, of South Australia and, and again, the national system. Um, so there's been a, a, a heavy focus in working with other jurisdictions who have consolidated biosecurity acts throughout this project. So we've had um, a number of conversations with Queensland, New South Wales, Tasmania and Western Australia, uh, and also um, starting conversations with Victoria and ACT uh, as well around this system, just to make sure that we're all sharing um, um, our best practice and, and um, aligning as much as possible and, and as appropriate. In terms of the outcome of the reform that we're trying to achieve, um, so with the new Biosecurity Act, South Australia will, for the first time, have a consistent legal uh, approach to biosecurity management under a single set of principles. Um, so that is, you know, having a single act, single set of objectives, a single set of processes uh, brings about a, a consistent approach and that single focus. Um, which would be a real benefit. So that's, that's not to say that we, you know, Biosecurity SA at the moment don't have a consolidated um, uh, focus or a, a set of principles. You know, we have the state biosecurity policy and, and the team works collaboratively together, but the legislation they work to is a patchwork of acts that have been developed independently. Um, well, we're considering the age of the impounding act over the last century. Um, so that means, you know, animal health, plant health, fisheries and aquaculture, biosecurity and the management of wild dogs will be um, sitting under the same consistent act. So one of the um, outcomes that we want to look at is, is how we can modernise. Um, so we want to introduce greater flexibility to respond to biosecurity threats and enable that action based on a reasonable suspicion of risk, which I've touched on already. We want to uh, enhance South Australia's ability to meet trade and market protocols and improve market access. Um, so for example, about establishing pest-free areas, uh, which are recognised by key export markets. We want to enable the identification and uptake of new technologies in biosecurity management and methodologies 
to support that strong biosecurity system. And we want to be able to appropriately share responsibility for biosecurity between government, industry and community. So some of these things I've touched on already, but you know, so in terms of that modernization sort of approach. The other outcomes we want is around improvements. So we want to reduce red tape as much as possible, you know, to use the government buzzwords. Um, and that will come about through consolidating administration. Um, so efficiency, reducing red tape for government, but also how businesses, industry interacts with um, biosecurity and the government and the legislation. We also want to empower industry to be able to take a lead, um, leading role through um, being able to be accredited as a third party under the Act. Um, and recognising appropriate existing industry practices to avoid any unnecessary duplication. So we don't want to set up a government requirement when an industry requirement gives us the same outcome uh, or, or a better outcome. We want to be able to recognise that and let industry do what industry do, does best in managing biosecurity where appropriate. We want to enable um, consistency in applying uh, evidence-based risk analysis approach to biosecurity management and events. We want to improve governance arrangements uh, and interaction with other related South Australian acts. We're going to ensure clear and strong powers for biosecurity officers uh, and comprehensive compliance framework to manage biosecurity risks and establish effective deterrence for those that seek to do the wrong thing. Um, and it's also an opportunity to enhance the knowledge of biosecurity across the South Australian community. So, um, you know, I think the current pandemic has, has done a lot around making people, uh, raising people's awareness around um, the spread of diseases um, and viruses and, and what that can mean. Um, and so, you know, developing a new biosecurity act is, again is another opportunity to, to make people aware of well, what are the risks here, how are they managed and, and what sort of tools do we need to actually effectively address the situation. Um, the other, oh, sorry, um, the other area is around um, consistency and efficiency as well. So, you know, it's creating a single act as an efficient harmonised system for both for government, industry, but also the community as well. Um, as I've touched on before, consistency with the, um, the national biosecurity management with the Commonwealth, but also other jurisdictions uh, where possible. Um, and also around the ability to establish um, any additional industry-based boards um, and funding mechanisms to achieve specific um, industry-based biosecurity outcomes as well, which I'll touch on a little bit more um, in a minute. Um, I just want to touch on as well briefly around um, how the uh, legislation will be designed. So we're looking at designing framework legislation. So what that means is that um, it'll essentially result in a general head of power, uh, so a general biosecurity act um, that will contain um, provisions required to uh, give effect to a particular policy or a particular system. Um, so all of the matters of importance um, will be contained within the biosecurity act, uh, but then the implementation or the detail of those matters will sit within subordinate instruments. And, and generally speaking, subordinate instruments is referring to regulations, but it's not always just regulations. So with this approach, you you have a number of regulations supporting the detail in the Act, or, or um, I guess um, um, you know, conveying the detail of how, how the legislation will be applied. Um, and that gives uh, a number of um, benefits in terms of the flexibility of the system. So regulations can be easily maintained and changed as new approaches um, uh, and new innovation comes into the system um, without the need for completely redesigning uh, the Act as well. So um, it gives that level of flexibility um, and also sort of future proofs the arrangements as well. So because um, the head of power doesn't need, well, the act doesn't need to continue to be redesigned every time you want to make improvements that can be done through the regulation. Um, and so the, the bill that comes out will be that general head of power, but we will also, and I'll touch on this later as well, we will um, do what we can to provide as much detail around the subordinate instruments. Uh, in parallel with the bill as well to try and give the complete picture of the, of the entire framework because some of that detail will be important in terms of explaining um, uh, where we want to went ahead. So moving on now, um, we've got a, a poll question here which I'll just launch. Oops. And looks like we have a Q&A coming in as well. So I'll launch the poll and then I'll just have a look at that question. Um, here. So uh, the question will pop up on the screen, so the same as before, just um, provide your response and then we can have a, a quick chat about the, um, the results.
<clears throat> All right, so Jen and I were just taking the opportunity to talk about some technical issues we've got with uh, who's able to host and, and control what's going on. So um, you weren't missing anything in terms of content. So thank you for those that have voted. Um, so it looks like, you know, in terms of the new um, modern act and how important that is to your sector or business. So, you know, a, a strong response there for um, very important and important. Uh, and a few not sure. So um, it's good to know that, you know, the, the new act is is important and that um, there's going to be um, with some opportunities, but also um, we'll have to watch closely to make sure that we are continuing to maintain the things that are important um, to, to industries, businesses at the moment as well, uh, when we go through and develop the new act. Oops, sorry, I didn't actually share the results, getting ahead of myself. Sorry, I'm still new to this. So yeah, there's the results up on your screen. So majority coming back as important, but um, a few there is very well, significant, a lot amount for very important and a few not sure. So hopefully you can all see that. Okay. So um, just touching again, I've touched on these briefly, but just um, a little bit more information around the, the core concept, the three core concepts uh, that are underpinning uh, the legislation uh, that we're proposing. So the first one around um, shared responsibility. So that will underpin and further strengthen um, the relationship uh, um, between government, industry, and the people of South Australia and how we work together to protect our economy, our environment, and community from the negative impacts of pests and diseases. And that's to the benefit of all South Australians. So a strong and effective biosecurity is in, in everyone's best interest. Um, and it really does rely on a partnership approach so not one um, um, part of that partnership can actually do it all by themselves. We, we really need everyone to work together. So to continue to protect South Australia's um, biosecurity, so government you know, will still continue to fulfil its role in biosecurity and provide adequate resourcing and, and lead and coordinate where, where appropriate. So you know, one example would be biosecurity responses and emergencies. Um, but we also want to empower industry and the community to be able to take, um, uh, you know, take ownership of biosecurity as well. So there'll be uh, mechanisms in the Act that enable industries, communities to be recognised and undertake biosecurity programs. But that's not to mean that um, government is no longer going to be fulfilling its current role um, in biosecurity. Um, so shared responsibility is not a new concept and especially not new in South Australia. Um, but we will require some new, um, well, we're proposing some new um, aspects to our legislation um, to uh, further express um, the concept of uh, shared responsibility. So, you know, arrangements for sharing responsibility are becoming more prevalent um, in biosecurity management as you look across examples across you know, Australia, but internationally as well, um, in terms of uh, codes of practice regulatory standards, uh, quality and market assurance schemes, uh, but also joint management plans are just a, a few examples of government industry partnerships in biosecurity. So one of the, um, I guess one of the more prominent ways that shared responsibilities proposed to be expressed in the new act is around the general biosecurity duty. So the act, new act proposes to establish this duty, which will create a legal obligation for all South Australians to use reasonable standards of care when dealing with any material that presents a biosecurity risk. So that would mean that a person will be legally required. So if a person is aware or reasonably should be aware that biosecurity risk exists, um, they need to ensure as far as reasonably practical that the risk is mitigated, eliminated or reduced. So similar requirements actually already exist in South Australia. So um, for example, there's the prohibiting of movement of disease stock the sale yards, sale yards under the Livestock Act, or the selling of fruit infested with uh, fruit fly under the Plant Health Act. So that's examples of you know, a duty of care and a responsibility that people need to take when managing biosecurity. So it's not, a, it's not an entirely new concept in South Australia. Um, and, and Section 6 of the Plant Health Act requires a person to report uh, a pest, um, pest affected plants uh, and products and take all reasonable measures to prevent any spread. So again, that's an example of a, a duty of care. Um, so a general biosecurity duty exists in other jurisdictions. Um, so New South Wales, Tasmania and Queensland all have a general biosecurity duty, um, or sometimes they're referred to as a general biosecurity obligation. Uh, and that's within their biosecurity acts. And within the de technical directions paper, there's actually a case study um, coming out of Queensland around how the general biosecurity duty has been used um, to address an issue with um, cattle being moved with cattle tick. 
Um, the next area around expressing shared responsibility is accreditation authorities. So the new Act proposes that the state government is able to recognise non-government organisations as accreditation authorities who will be authorised uh, to accredit biosecurity certifiers and auditors to order and inspect business uh, inspect business operations and provide product certification. Uh, again, not a new concept in South Australia, um, but it's not con consistently applied across our legislation. So it exists um, within the plant health um, space, uh, but it doesn't um, exist within the uh, animal health under the Livestock Act. So there's an opportunity there for accreditation uh, in the animal health industry. Um, the, um, this approach could also see a formal recognition of industry-based quality assurance programs for regulatory purposes. So there's some opportunities here in terms of empowering industry to take more of a, a leadership role. Um, another area where um, shared responsibility could be expressed is around biosecurity programs. Um, so we've looked at examples in Western Australia and Tasmania. So in Western Australia, their Biosecurity and Agricultural Management Act, so their BAM Act, uh, enables landholders to come together and establish a recognised biosecurity group. So this is an expression of shared responsibility as it enables communities and industries to partner with a range of organisations and that can include the state government um, agencies uh, and potentially access funding for their biosecurity program. Um, so the Western Australian Act allows a rate uh, to be raised or amount of money to be raised for the purposes of biosecurity in a recognised group uh, under the um, uh, operational area. Uh, and then the fund um, that are collected can be matched by the state government. So there's a, there's a process that they need to step through in terms of proposing and having their program assessed. But if it's approved, then it gives them the, um, options under the Biosecurity Act to enact that community or industry uh, or um, organisational based biosecurity program. So Tasmania has taken a similar approach in their Biosecurity Act, uh, which provides for biosecurity programs that can be administered by government. Uh, or an industry group or a, a non-profit uh, organisation such as an environmental organisation. So in Tasmania's Act, the um, biosecurity programs can be established for outcomes such as sort of eradicating weeds or managing feral animals um, uh, from a particular regional area or to promote the adoption of an industry-wide disease control and prevention measures um, or by a particular commodity sector. Um, so programs are a, another way of promoting the shared responsibility for biosecurity um, and partnerships between government, industry uh, and the community. Um, and so we're considering that um, as part of our Biosecurity Act. So it's a, an area you might um, see opportunities for and, and wish to give us some feedback on. Um, in terms of uh, risk-based decisions, um, as another area of the, the core concepts. Let's change my slide, sorry. Um, so, one of the guiding principles currently for biosecurity in South Australia is that uh, risk management um, is used to um, set priorities and investment across biosecurity management. Uh, and this, this is proposed to continue as uh, part of the new Biosecurity Act. So the aim of risk-based decision-making is to ensure that the steps taken to manage a biosecurity risk are effective and proportionate to the risk being uh, addressed. So the Biosecurity Act, um, as currently is the case, it will propose it proposes to focus on biosecurity risks that are or are, are likely to become a significant problem for the economy, uh, the environment, or uh, social amenity. So the identification, assessment, and prioritisation of biosecurity risks will help uh, ensure that any resources that need to be deployed uh, are deployed to the highest risk areas uh, and a most appropriate response is provided. Um, so to manage biosecurity risks, all reasonable and practical steps need to be taken to mitigate, eliminate or reduce the risk. Um, and the steps taken may depend on the likelihood of the risk occurring uh, and how serious the impact could be. So again, it's about matching our response, our intervention um, to the level of risk that it poses. Um, so a risk-based framework would provide the highest level of regulation in relation to uh, biosecurity matter declared as prohibited matter. Um, which is, and that's a matter that's likely to have significant adverse impacts uh, and therefore need to be tightly regulated. As the biosecurity risk decreases, the need for direct regulatory, regulatory control uh, would also decrease. So with low risk, you know, at the bottom end of the scale, uh, low risk biosecurity manage, um, matter could uh, likely be managed through the general biosecurity duty. 
Um, so any risk management approach um, and the, um, the decisions based on that risk management approach would absolutely be underpinned by science um, and um, risk analysis. Uh, and also would um, include uh, consultation and engagement um, to inform those risk analyses and also the policy development and the decision making based on those risk analysis um, when it comes to preventing and responding to managing biosecurity risks in South Australia. The third core concept um, around proactive biosecurity. So, you know, the, the good biosecurity um, you know, it has that focus on prevention and early detection because uh, if you get in early and address the situation early, you have much more um, success of um, actually getting you know, a, a better outcome, you know, eradication where it's possible and feasible. So that, that focus on prevention and early detection will provide the ability to be um, proactive uh, in response to emergency um, emerging biosecurity risks um, and then also making sure that we do have those strong and appropriate powers to actually respond in those emergencies as well where you know something is detected we also then flip into that response so we need to have good tools good powers to be able to do that so you know the biosecurity practices will follow that continuum of um, prevention detection eradication and um, ongoing management if that's required um, so our current legislation uh, already provides the ability to be proactive in managing um, most biosecurity risks and we look to build on that capacity uh, and ensure that gaps are addressed and where we can continue to take immediate action to manage biosecurity risks. So one of the areas that we do want to address is around um, biofouling of um, vessels moving and so biofouling being um, sort of organisms or um, you know, plants, animals um, being attached to the holes of vessels or infrastructure and moving from um, either different states or different regions within South Australia. And just the risk that um, things being carried on a whole present, um, you know, either through invasive species, but also any diseases that they may be carrying. Um, so it's, you know, building in better tools, we can be more proactive in terms of managing vessels um, that prevent, uh, pre sorry, um, uh, present a risk to, to South Australia. So the um, Plant Health Act and the Livestock Act already uh, enable action based on a reasonable suspicion um, and have proactive management tools. So you know, one example under plant health is the plant quarantine standard, uh, which imposes entry conditions to manage the risk of our plant to our plant industries. Um, and section nine orders under the Plant Health Act also put actions or the ability to put actions in place quickly while further uh, information is gathered. So that proactive is not new um, and it's, it's very important to continue on um, in that with that intent. Um, registration, certification and auditing, um, which I'll touch on a bit more in a minute, is also important contribution to regulate um, business dealings um, with biosecurity uh, and to proactively manage any risk that those business dealings create. Um, and so that the new the proposal in the act to be able to take um, action based on that reasonable suspicion, you know, that precautionary principle is really important um, without having to wait for that scientific confirmation. Um, so that will enable that rapid response and improve South Australia's ability uh, to prevent uh, new pest diseases establishing um, and protect our industries and also our environment as well. Oops. So just moving on now to another poll question. core concepts. So um, sorry, just bear with me. Uh, so question popping up about um, whether or not you support the, the three core concepts of shared responsibility, risk-based decision-making and um, proactive management. So I'll just give you a few moments to respond to that. And um, just a reminder as well, the um, Q&A box is available. So if you have any um, questions or comments that you want to put in there, uh, feel free to do so. Um, and also the ability to raise your hand as well if you want to have your microphone turn on to ask a question or, or to make a comment.
Okay, I might just call that to a close. Okay, so hopefully you can all see that on your screen. So thank you for your responses. Um, so in terms of the three core concepts, um, you know, we've got uh, ties between strongly agree and agree. Uh, and again, a, a few that are not sure. Um, and I'm, I'm guessing that, you know, um, the need, the desire to see a bit more detail about how they're going to be expressed and what impact um, um, those um, approaches may have on industries is maybe feeding into some of those um, not sure responses, which is completely fine. So, you know, we're on a, a, a bit of a journey here together and that, that detail will become available as we, we step through the project um, with the ultimate detail being captured within the bill. Um, so look forward to sharing that with you when that's available. So I'll just um, move on from there. So I just want to touch on now in terms of the scope of the Act. So what, what acts um, are we looking to actually include in the new Biosecurity Act? Um, you know, I've touched on a bit of this content before, but I want to talk about some of the, um, the core features of um, the Act in scope and then what some of the opportunities are as well. So the first Act being the Livestock Act, so it manages um, animal health. So the, the fundamental outcomes that we currently provide for in animal health will remain in the new Biosecurity Act. So they're things you know, around the strong powers that we need for prevention, detection, management and eradication of pests and diseases but also contaminants as well. Um, and also, you know, the ability to enable proof of freedom for market requirements is very important. So those, those will be carried over into the new Biosecurity Act. Um, there's also continuing on for that requirement for certain activities or industries to be registered with um, traceability systems in place as well. Um, the new Act will um, still have the ability to list biosecurity matters of concern, so under the livestock um, space, you know, notifiable conditions, um, and still require mandatory notification uh, on their presence or their suspected presence, which is really important for that rapid response. Uh, the new Act will also continue to provide the ability to implement restrictions on movement um, and put control orders in place or declare a biosecurity zone to ensure actions are taken day by day to manage the risks. Um, and also important prevention uh, initiatives. So for example, regulation of materials such as swill and ruminant feed uh, will continue to be part of biosecurity management. Um, some of the, um, highlighting some of the opportunities in animal health space. So um, as I've touched on, um, animal health doesn't currently, well, the Livestock Act doesn't currently um, allow for accreditation schemes which enable assurance certificates to be issued that confirm a product is free of, free of a pest or disease or has undergone a specified treatment. So that's a, an innovation um, in the plant health space that will be now available under this proposal uh, in the animal health space. Um, so that will be you know, available for the livestock industry. Um, the accreditation system will also have the ability to be applied to a third party, non-government provider. So empowering an industry to take the leading role in product certification where that's appropriate and, and the requirements can be met. So government can now do it for life, well propose that government will be able to do it for livestock um, for the animal health industry, but also empowering third parties to do that as well. Um, and then the new act is also proposed to have the ability to recognise appropriate existing industry-based quality assurance schemes as well. Um, so that's about empowering industry to take uh, a leading role, which is part of the Act's, again, core concept of shared responsibility uh, and avoiding any duplication for any requirements um, and you know, helping the, um, the cost and efficiency um, of um, doing business in South Australia or, or with South Australia. Um, so essentially, um, looking around animal health, so the Act will still have the ability to maintain that standard of biosecurity that we need uh, and effectively manage those that fail uh, or fall below that standard. Um, moving on to the Plant Health Act, so the plant health industries. So the fundamental, again, fundamental outcomes we currently provide for in plant health will remain in the new Biosecurity Act. So we still have the ability to regulate material through listing uh, and will still require mandatory reporting of their um, presence or suspected presence. Accreditation and certification schemes that currently exist in plant health uh, will continue along with the listing of importers that we have in place, which is a critical component of managing um, plant biosecurity status. And the plant quarantine standard will remain as well, which will outline the important requirements for important plant, importing plant and plant materials into South Australia. 
In terms of opportunities for improvement, um, as I've already mentioned, the new biosecurity app will have a consistent approach across all industries with a single set of principles. So that provides that opportunity uh, to support further traceability in our plant industries um, through the proposed introduction of property identification codes. Uh, and that's in line with the national property identification reforms that have been discussed at the national level. So the Biosecurity Act will be set up to enable that to happen even when that's required. Um, uh, so, you know, because it will be there for animal health and it's being a general act across all industries. Uh, if the plant health um, property identification codes come online then the Biosecurity Act will be there ready and waiting to enact that even when that's required. Traceability um, is, you know, is important for any market access requirements. Um, and so along with enhancing our ability to trace any biosecurity um, issues along the supply line. So, you know, bringing that traceability into the plant health or you know, bringing additional traceability into plant health would be um, an opportunity. Uh, and as you've also heard, the, um, the new act proposes to have the ability to recognize the appropriate uh, existing industries based quality assurance scheme. So again, that's across all sectors. Um, so that, as, as I've said in the animal health space, this will empower the plant industries um, or, um, to take a leading role in managing their biosecurity uh, and avoiding duplication um, uh, in the system. Uh, in terms of the Dog Fence Act, so wild dog management, um, so it's proposed that the new act will continue to establish the Dog Fence Board uh, and it's just, you know, their, their important role needs to continue um, along with their current um, funding arrangements and, and their, um, their, the operations and responsibilities of the board. Um, but by bringing the Dog Fence Board into the new act, um, it provides an opportunity uh, to address any sort of outdated and unworkable parts of the Dog Fence Act. So it's a quite an aged piece of legislation. Um, so some of the issues that we have, there's an inability to revoke a declared section of the act or, or transfer ownership, um, which is a problem with some of the, um, the new approaches or, or, or some of the things that we want to achieve um, to get a better outcome for the dog fence. Um, we're also an opportunity to better define and, and permit the permit the control of wild dogs uh, and the government arrangements around the management of the fence. So there's an opportunity here with the new legislation, bringing uh, this um, quite an old act into the mix. Um, and so PERSA will continue to work closely with the Dog Fence Board and stakeholders to ensure that the new act actually um, uh, provides those opportunities and, and gives us a better outcome uh, and improves on the current arrangements that we have. The Impounding Act, so our, our oldest act, um, gives me the ability to say over the last century, um, being of 1920, so um, land managers currently have a responsibility to ensure their stock do not wander from their property onto private land or, or, or public areas, public property. So the Impounding Act provides for the impounding of livestock and, is in, um, and so we're proposing to include that in the scope of the new Biosecurity Act. Um, so a majority of the Impounding Act is no longer used, no longer relevant. Um, so therefore the new Biosecurity Act um, will pick up on those provisions um, around the responsibilities and rights in relation to the management of stray and abandoned livestock um, in the context of, of managing the biosecurity risks that they pose to um, the public, uh, sorry, to landholders. Um, but then that also address public safety issues as well. So, you know, having a clear pathway for um, anyone who is in possession of stray livestock where they, they um, don't know who owns them, having the ability to, to keep, sell or destroy um, but they need to go through a process of, of a reasonable opportunity for the owner to be located and notified that their livestock um, have strayed and that they're in someone else's possession. So it's, it's about giving someone a clear pathway um, to be able to take action with stray livestock um, and just modernising um, that approach. In terms of um, fisheries and aquaculture biosecurity, so the development of the new act is a, a real opportunity to clarify roles and responsibilities um, in biosecurity. Um, between what, fish, what is fisheries and aquaculture responsibility and, and what is a biosecurity SA responsibility. Um, so biosecurity considerations um, will still form part of fisheries and aquaculture's management uh, and decision-making, but the new Biosecurity Act will, um, is proposing to establish mechanisms to enable biosecurity issues in fisheries and aquaculture to be managed uh, in a legislative sense um, as a biosecurity matter under the new act. So this will work by the Biosecurity Act complementing the Fisheries Management Act uh, and incorporating similar powers in the Fisheries Management Act to enable noxious species uh, to be managed under the Biosecurity Act. 
um, but powers will still remain in the Fisheries Management Act to ensure that um, management of uh, put and take fisheries, uh, release and escape of aquaculture fish and conservation restocking can continue to be appropriately led by fisheries and aquaculture under their legislation. So the powers that we're looking to move into biosecurity still have application in fisheries and, and um, aquaculture. So we want to make sure that um, it's it's a replication without duplication, if that's not too being too cute. Um, but oh, and the other um, point to touch on as well is that um, section 130 of the Fisheries Management Act um, is the relation to the prevention, control, and eradication of this exotic um, organism organism. Uh, will be um, repealed and replaced um, with the new Biosecurity Act because it more appropriately resides there. So that will be a change to the Fisheries Management Act. But regardless of the legislation, Biosecurity SA and Fisheries and Aquaculture are in the same department and they work very closely together, have a very good working relationship, and that will continue to do so. It's just about where the clarity sits within the legislation. So if we have an um, uh, a situation we're trying to manage, we're not going, is it this act or is it that act? There's a lot more clarity in place. Um, and that will help as well with the management of diseases. Um, they'll be improved under the new Act because currently powers to manage um, aquatic animal health resides within the um, Aquaculture Act, the Livestock Act and the Fisheries Management Act. Um, and domestic or captive aquatic animals are actually classified as livestock under the Livestock Act, which manages notifiable diseases. Uh, but for wild aquatic organisms, the Fisheries Management Act is used. You can see there's, there's a, a number of um, different pieces of legislation coming in there uh, and playing in that space. Uh, in addition to um, the scope, of, uh, the, so the direct, um, uh, I guess, impact on um, this legislation, the, the, the new Act will need to work closely alongside with other pieces of legislation to make sure that they're talking to each other well and that they're, they're, um, they're, they're not, um, I guess, overriding or creating any issues that are unintended. Um, so there's a lot of relevant acts that you know, help manage biosecurity or are closely related that they'll need to talk to each other uh, and complement each other. So there's the Foxer and Grape Industry Act, there's the Landscape South Australia Act, the Emergency Management Act, um, and also you know, public health legislation as well in terms of um, um, you know, zoonosis diseases as well, managing those and with animal health. Moving on now to another poll question. Oops, I just watched that one. So the scope of the act, just give you um, a minute or so to respond to that one. Okay, I might just call an end to that one. Okay, so, um, so, um, oops, I haven't shared the results, I'm sorry. Um, so quite a good response there for agree, um, strongest response there. So, you know, the, the Biosecurity Act is, is largely covering what you expect. Again, a few not sure, um, and then, you know, um, some strongly agree as well. So that, that's good, um, that um, the scope of the act, I think, um, is generally um, as people are expecting it um, to be. So um, just chatting to Jen then while I was muted about, um, I probably need to pick up the pace a little bit. Um, there's a lot to get through and we're already 50 minutes in and looking to finish in 40 minutes time. So I will um, just speed up. Um, so hopefully you can still stay with me, um, but uh, you know, raise your hand if uh, you need me to cover any ground again or, or clarify anything. So the next area I just want to touch on is governance and administration in the new Act. Um, so the, we currently have what we refer to as statutory positions in the current legislation, um, and we're proposing that that continues in the new Act. 
So we're proposing a chief veterinary officer and a chief plant protection officer as the principal authorised officers. Um, they're not new, as I've said, so the Livestock Act and the Plant Health Act already have chief officers. And so it's a continuation of that model. Um, so they would have legal uh, roles and responsibilities in the Act and, and would take on a lot of the day-to-day -day, um, operations and, and um, technical decision-making under the legislation. Um, one of the areas that we can make an improvement from, um, I guess, in terms of the way um, government uh, interacts with legislation is around the deputy chief officers. So having the ability to appoint a number of deputy chief officers who have the same powers uh, as the chief officers um, so we can have continuation of decision-making and resourcing, um, which is particularly important in an emergency situation because the chief officer is um, not available 24 seven. Um, so that gives the ability to, for a chief officer, deputy chief officer to step up and um, uh, keep, keep the ball rolling, so to speak, keep the balls in the air um, in those circumstances. Um, so that's, this approach is proposed rather than establishing a single chief biosecurity officer, which, which is a, another option. Uh, as it ensures the roles are clearly defined and, they, and also that the distinct technical expertise um, for plant health, animal health um, is in place uh, and it's um, it, uh, getting involved in the decision making uh, that affects those industries. Uh, it also creates a level of independence and separation of powers and so they have their own role, their own decision making powers rather than having those delegated by you know, a chief executive or a minister. Um, so, as I said, those statutory positions, along with the authorised biosecurity officers, would be a lot of the day-to-day -day, um, technical and operational functions under the Act. Um, statutory authority. So, biosecurity in South Australia is, is delivered in partnership with um, some key statutory authorities, um, and each of those authorities have their own defined roles and responsibilities as articulated in the Acts that establish them. Um, so they provide a, a really important contribution uh, and share responsibility for our biosecurity and, and, have, and um, facilitate really strong engagement uh, and those partnerships. So this can be an, an excellent model for biosecurity uh, um, outcomes. Um, and so we want the new Biosecurity Act to have the power to establish any additional um, statutory authorities by regulation um, in the future, if, if that's what um, uh, is desired either by government or by industry. So in recognition of it being a good model, the Biosecurity Act will be able to establish additional authorities and that will obviously happen in consultation um, even when the time comes. In terms of uh, registration uh, and traceability, so registration system is fundamental uh, for the operation of um, effective traceability systems and biosecurity responses. Um, the Livestock Act already requires um, registration uh, and as does the Plant Health Act as well. So again, not a new concept. Um, so we'll continue, we'll propose to continue to provide for registration. Um, uh, and the, I guess, what triggers the requirement for registration, either activities or um, uh, businesses or, or dealings, um, that detail will be expressed in regulations. Uh, the registration system, you know, of course, will need to be flexible, so there's no unnecessary burden on industries. Um, and, you know, so we want to build in some flexibility, so the ability to have exemptions, either general or case by case, um, in certain circumstances, but also having permits um, that can be used in lieu of registration. So if someone wants, you know, a zoo or a circus wants to move a line, then they can have a permit rather than need to register and go through that process. Um, and there was sort of worth um, thinking through um, the uh, ability to have enterprise registration. So if there's a, a business that deals with a number of registrable dealings, um, they register once for a number of things rather than having to register for each individual thing. Um, and also the uh, ability to recognise interstate registration um, is being proposed as well. So you know, businesses that reach across borders, um, you know, that meet South Australia's requirements, well, that that um, registration can be recognised. And in terms of traceability, so being, being able to track produce through all stages of production, processing, and distribution you know, is important, you know, including uh, importation and retail. Um, so that's critical to managing biosecurity. Uh, as it enables rapid identification uh, and um, of relevant properties in response to a pest or disease outbreak. Um, it's also important for product assurance and assessing domestic and international markets, uh, as well as assisting to identify where properties with susceptible crops or relevant supply chain premises are located. 
Um, so the new Biosecurity Act will continue to um, support traceability through registration, property identification codes, um, and current traceability systems will continue. But we also want to set up the Act uh, in such a way that it can facilitate any expansion of traceability systems in the future. In terms of accreditation authorities, um, part four of the Plant Health Act already provides for the establishment of accreditation scheme. Um, and enables an authorised person to uh, issue um, assurance certificates in relation to the movement of a plant or plant related product uh, and, and also verify assurance certificates or other documents or the packaging or labelling of plants or plant related products. Uh, but the Livestock Act doesn't um, provide for these accreditation schemes. So the new Biosecurity Act uh, will pro is proposing to provide for accreditation, accreditation schemes across um, the board. Um, so then you know, that can be applied more broadly um, and providing further opportunities. Um, so again, I've touched on this, but the new Biosecurity Act also proposing the ability to recognise non-government organisations as accreditation authorities, uh, and then uh, giving them the ability to in turn accredit biosecurity certifiers and biosecurity auditors to audit and inspect business operations and provide product certification. Um, in terms of auditing, um, so, you know, we need to provide for an auditing scheme. It's very important for um, interstate and international market access agreements and also for compliance and managing risk. So it's proposed that the new Biosecurity Act will um, require auditing as a condition of registration for high risk biosecurity dealings uh, to check in compliance and that those risks are being appropriately managed. Um, audits could also be used during the assessment of applications for registration and accreditation. Um, or to check compliance with the conditions of registration um, and um, accreditation. Moving on to certification. Uh, so the new Biosecurity Act will continue to support certification schemes. Uh, it's not a new concept uh, with South Australia's current involvement in the national certification scheme, uh, which relates to the movement of plant and plant products known as the, um, the ICA or the Interstate Certification Assurance Scheme. The new Biosecurity Act will be developed to enable certification of produce to be expanded across other industries if required. So um, to enable the, um, for example, to enable the certification that livestock are free of a pest or disease would be an opportunity. Um, you know, by continuing to provide for certification in the new Biosecurity Act, um, provide assurance that allows for the transit of certified produce um, within South Australia and, and interstate. Um, touching on permits, so we're proposing that um, permits um, would be issued that allow for a broad range of actions to be undertaken um, that would otherwise be in contravention or in, in breach of the Act. So permits would only be provided where the Chief Officer is satisfied that there is a good and valid reason uh, for the proposed activity and may be subject to conditions or limitations. Uh, and before approving a permit, there would need to be consideration of factors such as you know, the biosecurity risk uh, of the pest or disease or the proposed activity, uh, the level of risk management required, um, and also the length of time um, for the permit. So those would all need to be considered by the, the um, person approving the permit. Uh, the last point around prohibited matter. So the new Biosecurity Act will continue to provide for all prohibited matter to be declared and publicly listed, uh, along with a requirement to notify uh, PERS's Biosecurity SA if prohibited matter is discovered. So prohibited matter is a um, is biosecurity matter that would have a significant adverse impact on the economy or the environment if it entered the state. Um, prohibited matter could be pests, diseases, pathogens, you know, plant, animal, or aquatic, uh, or carriers of disease or pathogens. Um, the Plant Health Act also enables the declaration of things other than pests and diseases to be regulated. Uh, for example, packaging, timber, equipment, machinery, um, and that um, important requirement will continue within the new Biosecurity Act. Um, and at the moment, listing is currently through publication in the Government Gazette, um, but um, talking to those that will draft the bill, we want to have a conversation around if there's a more modern way of doing that, whether or not publication on the website um, is sufficient, or it might be the Government Gazette and the website, but um, yeah, most people go to websites these days rather than picking up the Government Gazette. Um, so just put in another poll question. And there's actually two questions for this poll, so I'll, um, I'll move through these pretty quickly. So um, first one around, do you support continuing to provide for a Chief Veterinary Officer and a Chief Plant Protection Officer? So that's the dual statutory position. The other option, of course, is having a, a single Chief Biosecurity Officer. So let's give you a moment there to respond.
Okay. Um, sorry, I'm just checking my, I just had to change my headset. Yes, so you should all, I think you can all still hear me. If you can't, let me know. Um, so, yep, strongly agree um, and, and agree for the, the dual statutory positions. And again, a few not sure, it's fine. So I'll just move on to the, oh, I didn't share those results. You think I'll be used to this by now, I apologize. Um, so there's the results there on your screen. Uh, I'll just move on to the uh, next question now, in the interest of time. So this one is around, do you support non-government entities being accredited under the Act to undertake certification auditing? So this is the third party accreditation um, that government doesn't need to do all of these things. Um, you know, industry uh, can take a role as well. Okay, so um, a few more not sure in this one. So this is, um, so I guess um, how this is gonna be expressed and how this is gonna be work, how this is gonna work in the new act will be a really important area for us to, to explain and highlight uh, and what the opportunities are. And you know, if there's any current um, systems out there um, or programs out there that um, may be good candidates, maybe looking at those and seeing how they fit with the legislation. Um, but there is also some agreement as well, um, but also some disagreement. So um, that's an, an area we'll need to um, talk more about once we have some more detail to hand. All right, so moving on. So compliance, now I'm on the home stretch here. Um, I'll continue to keep up the pace because I really do want to provide that opportunity for, for um, questions of the panel at the end. So in terms of compliance, what we're proposing is um, an approach um, so, so PERSA, um, you know, being administrating the um, Biosecurity Act and the current legislation, we're responsible for monitoring and enforcing compliance with our, uh, with the legislation. Um, but what we're proposing in the new Biosecurity Act is a flexible and responsive, responsive um, compliance framework that is commensurate to the risk being managed. So that's, that's not one size fits all, that's a scalable model. Um, so that um, scalable of, um, approach would um, focus on promoting voluntary compliance at, at one end, um, which creates effective deterrence and responding to non-compliance in a way that takes into account the circumstances and behaviours um, and the public interest. So the model of compliance assumes, this model, um, assumes that most people will comply or try to comply with their obligations under the legislation. But despite having good intentions, some people may inadvertently fail to comply because they don't understand their requirements um, so therefore, in this situation, there may be an increase in monitoring or audit uh, rates uh, until compliance be uh, established, for example. Um, then, as you step up through the, the, um, the scale, some people may choose to knowingly do the wrong thing uh, if an opportunity arises. So it's important to ensure there are effective deterrence strategies in place to deter people from making the wrong choices. So there's an opportunity, you need to make sure that the risk of taking that opportunity is strong as it, so it is an effective deterrent. And then at the, uh, the more extreme end of the scale, there's a small number of people who may choose to deliberately contravene the law to avoid regulatory actions or gain uh, an advantage. So the gov government will respond with the appropriate enforcement action available, uh, and that may include criminal prosecution before a court of law. Uh, authorised officers, um, it's critical that authorised biosecurity officers have sufficient powers to take action under the new Biosecurity Act when required. So the new Biosecurity Act uh, is not looking to remove or diminish any of the current powers from the current system that are available, um, but we want to street to strengthen um, appropriate powers uh, by, of the officers by consolidating and, and having consistency across the legislation um, and looking to that national, nationally accepted best, best practice model uh, for the standard set of um, powers and compliance um, tools available. So having standardised and contemporary powers for biosecurity officers um, um, you know, with a broad focus across all biosecurity management will be really important um, in the Act. Um, and that would also be a, a consistent with other jurisdictions who have introduced modern and consistent biosecurity officer powers to investigate, monitor and enforce compliance with their legislation. Um, biosecurity direction. So um, we want the new Biosecurity Act to provide the ability for a biosecurity officer to issue a direction. Um, so that might be, you know, wash down this equipment or, you know, um, take this action before leaving an area. 
Um, and there'll be two types of directions available um, we're proposing. There's the one being a general direction that would apply generally across uh, an industry or an activity or an individual direction, which would be uh, to an individual or a business. Um, so authorised officers, biosecurity officers will have the ability to issue a biosecurity direction if they reasonably believe it's necessary uh, to manage any biosecurity uh, risk or impact uh, or to enforce the act. Um, biosecurity directions, again, not a new concept in South Australia. Um, under the current Livestock Act, general notices can be issued by the minister, published in the Gazette, um, and um, also provides for individual orders uh, to control or eradicate a disease or contamination to be issued as well. Um, in the plant health space, um, there's an ability for the chief inspector to issue an order to prevent or minimise the outbreak or spread of a pest. Um, and so, and, um, so again, it's just building on those concepts and making sure they're consistently applied. Um, the biosecurity directions will um, set out any actions that must be taken, the grounds for the directions, uh, and if you put applicable, the nature of the non-compliance that's seeking to be addressed. Uh, and if a person doesn't comply, then the biosecurity um, officer, well, there's, you know, there's the option of applying a penalty, um, but there's also the ability for the act, um, biosecurity officer to either undertake the action themselves or uh, uh, cause the action to be undertaken and costs to be recovered. Um, control orders. Um, so both the Plant Health and Livestock Act currently provide for orders. Um, and you know, proposing that the Biosecurity Act continues um, along these lines. Um, so that would enable directives to be given that can be applied regionally or statewide. Um, that, um, so orders will provide for rapid response uh, where a new biosecurity risk is identified, but an emergency response uh, is not warranted. So as proposed, the control order will be able to prohibit, regulate or control activities to prevent the introduction or eradicate biosecurity matter uh, that poses a biosecurity risk. Um, and then, so control orders are not intended to be long-term management tools, um, but they'll have the ability to be made quickly, providing an immediate response to a biosecurity risk while longer-term management options and arrangements are being developed. Um, they could also be used to transition out of emergency uh, orders as well. We need some medium-term measures in place before we get to long-term measures uh, if they're required. Um, Biosecurity zones. Um, so under the Plant Health Act, the minister um, is already able to declare the whole or portion of a state as a quarantine area for the purposes of controlling or eradicating a disease or contamination. Uh, and under the Livestock Act, the minister um, is able to prevent, uh, so prohibit entry into or movement within or out of the state or a specified area of the state uh, of livestock products or other property. So it's proposed that the Biosecurity Act will continue uh, to enable these um, establishment of biosecurity zones uh, to allow flexible response um, to biosecurity risks where uh, situations where specific management arrangements um, are required. So biosecurity zones are more for your long-term management uh, of ongoing biosecurity issues or impacts. So biosecurity um, zones will be related to a specific defined area where action must be taken when interacting with the biosecurity zone. Um, and the defined area of the biosecurity zone could be either the whole of the state or any part of the state. Um, so they'll generally be used when eradication is not feasible, uh, but there's still a high biosecurity risk requiring action to manage impacts. Um, they could also be used where different management actions are needed in different parts of the state or to protect part of the state from a biosecurity risk that occurs elsewhere in the state. Um, so biosecurity zones would be established by regulation is what we're proposing. Um, and they'll be similar to control order, will work by defining certain actions that are required either in or outside of the biosecurity zone, um, and then um, to, to manage that biosecurity risk. In terms of, uh, of just for an example of the zone, so the proof of um, the fruit fly zone in the Riverland, that could be a biosecurity zone. You can make Kangaroo Island a biosecurity zone to um, manage the biosecurity um, issues around the bee populations. Um, so they're just examples of, of what could be considered uh, and established as biosecurity zones under the new act. Um, offences. So under the current, as per the current legislation, the new Act will have a series of um, and range of offences, um, and they will be uh, clearly listed in the draft bill. So um, they they'll, you, they'll be there for you to see in terms of what the offence is and what the um, the penalty is for that offence. So um, there'll be an opportunity to provide feedback on those um, once the draft bill is available. 
Um, but there will be uh, a move to increase penalties um, because um, their age legislation, the penalties are not um, uh, no longer effective deterrence to some of the risks that they're trying to manage. So I'm just in the interest of time, I'm going to skip the poll question uh, and just move on to emergency management. So um, biosecurity emergencies, and the new act will still provide the legal framework required to deal with biosecurity emergencies and will continue to be guided by national approaches. Um, and, you know, as well as the national emergency response deeds, uh, agreements and plans. Um, so we already have emergency um, management procedures in place uh, and we already have plans in place and we already interact with state emergency management um, approaches as well. Um, so that will continue, but we'll also look for how we improve the governance arrangements and any tools that we need to improve in that area. Um, the new Biosecurity Act will have the ability to establish emergency um, orders and to take quick action, strong action in a case where um, you know situation uh, is emerging and, and, and needs to be addressed immediately, um, and also emergency zones as well, um, which will have their own emergency measures. Um, so that will the difference between sort of control orders will be you know the speed in which they can be enacted. They're not for as long a period of time, uh, and some of the measures that can be put in place, and also the penalties for non-compliance as well uh, would be stronger in an emergency situation. Uh, so again, I'll, I'll skip that poll question because I want to get the opportunity for you to ask questions. Um, the last point um, for me is just around next steps. So we've, at the start of this, I've touched on some of the work we've done just very briefly. You know, the last 18 months that this project has been running, we've, we went out as early as possible to have conversations in a, a targeted way with uh, um, uh, our key stakeholders to get feedback in the, in the direction that we wanted to head. So there's been a number of um, uh, conversations that have led into the draft directions paper, feedback on that paper, a number of workshops, forums um, that have led, led us to the version that has been released for this public consultation. Um, uh, process that we're currently in. The next step is to uh, you know, consider um, and, and look at all of the feedback that we're going to receive through webinars, um, survey responses and submissions uh, and use that to inform um, how we are actually going to approach the drafting of a, of a biosecurity bill. Uh, and once we have a draft biosecurity bill, um, we'll actually um, and give another opportunity for, for you to have a look at that and provide feedback on the bill. Um, and we'll also make sure we provide um, supporting information around that because you know, legislation is not always the easiest thing to read. So we want to provide explanatory guides and also want to provide a document that um, I guess you could say translates the current legislation into the new legislation. So some of the things I've talked about in animal health and plant health that are really important, where can they be found in the new act so people can make those linkages um, in parallel to that, and as much as possible, we're going to be looking at the draft um, regulations for board and instruments because um, um, one, they inform the design of the bill, uh, but also you know how those policy positions, how that detail is going to be expressed um, is really important. So we want that to be available um, as much as possible um, um, in parallel to the bill. Uh, but the usual course of things is, is you have the bill pass parliament and then regulations follow. But you know there's also a lot of work, so getting started on that early. Uh, and, um, and, and doing as much consultation around that as we possibly can. Um, once the biosecurity bill passes through Parliament, um, there um, will be the um, commencement and implementation of the Act, and there's a, you know, a time limit on that, so um, two years for an Act to be implemented um, once it um, um, commences. Uh, and so there'll be a period of time there to then refine regulations, um, go through policy positions and do further engagement. Um, before the framework is complete. Um, so we're looking to introduce a bill next year, but the work to actually complete the legal framework will continue on um, beyond um, 2021. Um, so now I just want to um, so just invite John and Nathan to, I guess, unmute and turn on their um, videos if they, if they feel that way inclined. Um, and just an opportunity for um, any of you to um, ask a question um, that you may have um, and um, we'll do our best to respond. Oh, we've got three. That's uh, so the three I could see on my screen. Okay, so the first one, um, so from Andy around, um, cynics may say that uh, the shared responsibility principle opens up the door to cost shifting to industry. Um, however, it enables stronger inputs by technical capability and sits in industry. So um, John, I believe you wanted to have a go at this one. 
Uh, yeah, thanks, uh, Andrew. Thanks, Andy, for your question. And I think the intended meaning of that shared responsibility, I know it sort of differs in terms of what government thinks is shared responsibility versus industry, but the intended meaning is certainly, as you intimated, that we all need to participate in South Australia's biosecurity system in terms of not bringing in new pest or diseases. So that's a community, it's a government, that's an industry role. And also in terms of controlling ones we have so they don't spread further. So this, this certainly includes um, industry leadership in farm and industry biosecurity best practice. Um, we don't want to everybody, if governor's not the only go-to in terms of where that technical expertise and that, that I suppose, industry best practice information lies. Yeah. Thanks, John. Um, so um, interject if you want to add anything, Nathan, that's fine. Um, so moving on to the next. Um, um, I, mean, I, might oh. just add, you know, I think that the, the thing that um, is of primary benefit to industry on that point is that it provides them the opportunity to undertake those biosecurity activities at the time that suits them. You know, if we had to provide an office to inspect or, or undertake a certain function on site, that would be through our certain span of hours. Uh, whereas, you know, if an industry wanted to offer operate 24-7 and could certify their own goods under a scheme approved by us and audited by us uh, and accepted by interstate trading partners, and that would give them the flexibility to offer, operate, uh, you know, as they wish. So there's an efficiency to be gained there. Absolutely, thank you. Um, so the next question um, from Shauna, um, from my experience with Biosecurity Acts in Queensland, New South Wales, the introduction, introduction sorry, of a general biosecurity duty or obligation uh, and risk-based decision-making um, also reduces the prescriptiveness of the Act. So why you know, this makes sense if you're wanting to match the response to the risk, this has less led to confusion both by regulators um, and landholders or industry. Um, so on that one, so the, the general duty, um, you're right, is, is, you know, how does someone discharge their duty? When, when are they failing to meet their duty? Um, when do they have a duty? Um, there is some, um, I guess, some uh, questions being raised in that space. And I know that um, when Queensland, talking to some of the um, local government areas uh, in Queensland, that was something that they grappled with as well. Um, and so it really is around, well, if people have a duty, it's about providing information around, well, how do you discharge that duty uh, and providing that support? And then there's also the reasonable test as well. So when should someone reasonably aware? Um, so the, you know, the case study that we um, included in the directions paper around the cattle tick, I think, you know, it highlights that, you know, that's, that's the, the only one I'm aware of in Australia where there's been a prosecution under the general biosecurity duty. And I think it's a pretty clear case that, you know, there was, cattle um, from a non-cattle tick area moved through, sorry, cattle from a cattle tick um, infected area moved through non-cattle tick, cattle were allowed to escape. There was an infection um, situation. That's a very clear breach of duty. Um, and so it's those sorts of situations um, where, you know, it's, it's a lot more clearer, but then, you know, there's that need to provide supporting information to help people understand their duty and how it's discharged. But I don't know, John or Nathan, if you wanted to add anything around that. Oh, John? Uh, oh, I suppose you yeah, can add in there that um, there is still that um, under the, the proposed Biosecurity Act, you're still looking at declaring sort of specific high risk pests or diseases, and that will probably still be the primary mechanism around which compliance will be focused. And you've got restrictions on movement, requirement control, all of that would still apply. So, in my view, the general biosecurity duty and compliance would um, be in uh, it maybe as you said earlier in your presentation, where it's a low risk species that doesn't just justify for by declaration. But any use of that GBD in compliance would need to be informed by a standard risk assessment process um, and backed up by educational programs on what is best practice. So, I mean, the, the key thing there is that you want a broad understanding in, in the industry community on what is expected behaviour to minimise biosecurity risks. And an example that comes to mind for me in terms of where a general biosecurity duty could come into play is if someone is taking farm machinery or uh, construction machinery that's heavily covered in mud and taking it across a new region or into South Australia or say across to Kangaroo Island and that's not necessarily about a specific pest or disease but clearly you would be at risk of introducing um, uh, plant or animal diseases in that soil or even weed seeds. Hmm. Thanks John. Um, so another question from uh, Sean. Oh. No, so um, is there any thought, so from, sorry, from Shauna again, is there any thought to include weeds and pest animals under this act in the future? 
So I think um, on this one is there's it's, it's, it's about the interaction of this legislation with other legislation. Um, so we have the Landscape South Australia Act, um, which has the um, the governance arrangements around it for managing um, weeds and pest animals. Um, and there's the, the regional landscape board, which have their connection to the community and the governance and funding arrangements around those. Um, so it's about how does this act actually work with that legislation. But we've got the man with the detail here as well, John Virtue. So I might um, just hand to him as well if he wants to make any points around this one. Uh, thanks, Andrew. Yes, the government's just decided that the Landscape Act wouldn't be included in the Biosecurity Act. And clearly you've just got the landscape boards getting underway in the Landscape Act, and that's been a major government initiative. Um, as you say, it would be how do those two um, acts interact? Um, certainly in other jurisdictions, weeds and pest animals are within their biosecurity acts, but we've got a different situation in South Australia. I think the key thing and where, where we sort of value uh, uh, feedback is how those two actually interact so that you are getting that um, uh, the prevention, the importance of prevention, early detection in the biosecurity act and you're getting that that uh, similar similar um, uh, scope within the, within the, um, the landscape system. Thanks, John. Okay, so that's that's it for the questions that have been put in the Q&A box. So if you do have another question, um, please, um, oh, no, here we go. We have another one coming. So from Richie, so um, biosecurity property signage uh, seems to have little or no effect on visitors entering a property and informing owners of their movements. So from our experience, it is ignored. Is there anything in the new act that will support the implementation and education uh, on the importance of this? Um, so I guess, so I know through um, the issue around that's come up around farm trespass, um, other jurisdictions have um, required um, signage as, as, as I guess a, a point where um, if signage is clearly um, visible on the outside of a property and someone ignores that signage and enters the property, then yeah, that triggers um, some of the protections that have been built into their farm trespass. Um, uh, legislation. So around, uh, you know, in Queensland, there's the need to have a biosecurity plan. So it's it's um, it's not adhering to that biosecurity plan, which then opens up a trespasser to prosecution. Um, so the farm trespass um, in South Australia is managed separately uh, as a criminal issue under the Summary Offences Act, and will continue to do so. Um, so there's no legislative. Um, we're not proposing any legislative basis of signage um, on the on um, properties. Uh, a requirement um, to have that. Um, but that said, you know, your point around, um, you know, it's about educating and notifying people, then, you know, how, how, how do we use this opportunity of building um, a new act to actually educate the public around the importance of biosecurity is really important. So that education um, is, is a really important aspect of biosecurity and raising that awareness. Um, so, um, yeah, so again, no, no legislative basis plan for signs, but you know, if you've got um, good ideas and feedback around that, um, please let us know. But John, Nathan, if you have anything you want to add? Andy. No, oh good. Okay, um, I just, um, so Robbie, I see your question, but Andy um, Poynton has raised his hand. So I'm just going to unmute uh, Andy uh, and let him ask his question. So Andy, um, over to you. Oops, sorry. Oh. Andy, you have to unmute yourself. I'm sorry, I'm not that powerful. There we go. <laughs> okay, how's that? That's good. I can hear you um, loud and clear. This is just a, uh, an observation. It's not a question. I had a call from a pig producer the other day where he had to accost a truck of people lopping trees, uh, contractors to um, um, the power of, oh, what do they, Power network in South Australia, and basically, when they approached them, they, they'd driven past a biosecurity sign saying "ring this number to gain entry." Mm. And when they were approached, oh, SA Power Networks, uh, when they were approached, the guy said, "Oh yeah, we do that. We drive past them all the time. We just ignore them." And it, just an observation, education. Mm. All right, that's, that's that's a good comment. So I'll take that on board. The um, we're having conversations with SA Power Networks, so it's um, a good comment. Thank you. Okay, so we've got a question here from Robbie Davis. So um, as SA is the only state with a Landscape Act separated from Biosecurity Act, uh, are there any issues at a national level? John, did you want to 
Um, Probably yeah, more no, I, mean, I, I don't think, sorry, I mean, well, obviously we don't have the Vice Key Act at the moment, but I think in terms of the Landscape Act, we do seek to, um, through, say, the Intergovernmental Committee, the Environment and Invasives Committee, there's a lot of collaboration that goes on between jurisdictions in terms of, um, one example there, I suppose, is weeds of national significance. There was agreement that they should all be declared under the respective acts around the country. So. I don't, I don't see that as a, as a major issue at this point in time. I think it's still, um, it's, there's still a, a reasonable level of collaboration and, and coordination amongst jurisdictions in the, in the field of weed and pest management. Excellent. Okay, so that no one's got their hand up and there's no questions in the Q&A. So um, unless you have a question, um, I might just um, Thank everyone for your participation. Um, thank you for coming along. It's um, you know, I've done a lot of talking. It's a huge amount of information. I appreciate that. But thank you for for listening. Um, and uh, everything I've covered is captured in the technical directions paper. So if you want to re uh, um, go over what I've said or, or, or get a, a bit further detail, and that's within that document. But we are also available for any conversations or meetings that you want to have. So please reach out to us. Uh, and, and I encourage you to go to the Your Say website as well, uh, where there's the opportunity to take a survey or provide us with a general submission, um, either by post or email or both. Um, uh, so we'd love to hear what you think around what we're proposing and help us really um, get the best outcome uh, in designing the new bill as well. Um, so really looking forward to receiving your feedback and, and just reiterate we are here um, if you need us and, and want to reach out and have a conversation. So um, thanks again for your participation uh, and uh, we'll talk to you all soon and um, best, best of luck for the rest of your day, what's left of it. Thanks very much.